Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the closing ceremony of the Immigration, Refugee, and Citizenship Law Moot. My name is Judy Mikeley, along with Tony Navanilan. I am the co-chair of this Moot's organizing committee, and I will be your host this evening. Please be aware that there is simultaneous interpretation available for this event. To listen, listen to the French stream, please click on the interpretation button found at the bottom of your screen. To begin our closing ceremonies, I wish to acknowledge the traditional territories on which we gather during this virtual event, including those of the Algonquin, Anishinaabe, Wendat, Haudenosaunee, Métis, Mississaugas of the Credit, Kanien Kehaka, Cree, Blackfoot, Nakota Sioux, and Sekwampek peoples. As we gather virtually in locations across Turtle Island to discuss issues related to global migration, it is important to recognize and acknowledge the indigenous people on whose land we are grateful to live and work. I'd like to take a moment at the beginning right now to thank everyone who made this moot possible. There were so many people who volunteered their time so generously and they include those who acted as judges over the last two days, the coaches and the law students, the federal court clerks and department of justice articling students who worked as registrars, and the multitude of various committee members who volunteered their time to put this uh, wonderful program together. In addition, this moot would not be possible without the generous support of our sponsors, Baker McKenzie, the Canadian Association of Refugee Lawyers, the Canadian Immigration Lawyers Association, the Department of Justice, the Delage Law Group, McCarthy Tetro and MTI Plus, and the Refugee Lawyers Association of Ontario. Thank you so much for your ongoing support. Now we have a few things planned for you tonight. First, we'll kick off the event with opening remarks from Chief Justice Crampton of the Federal Court. We will then hear our keynote speaker, Justice Evans. Following this, we'll hand out the awards to our mooters. And in between all of the, these events, we'll have a guided cocktail and mocktail making session by renowned cocktail maker, lawyer, and lead committee member, KCB. Please note that before beginning the awards portion of the evening, we will have a five minute break so everyone can get up and stretch and, and do whatever they'd like to do. So let's kick things off. I would now like to introduce Chief Justice Crampton, the Chief Justice of the Federal Court of Canada to kick off the event. Over to you, Chief Justice. Thank you very much. Well, uh, bonsoir à tous. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, tout d'abord, j'aimerais uh, féliciter uh, tous les participants pour avoir performé <laughs> à un niveau uh, impressionnant au cours de tout ce, uh, ce, ce deuxième uh, école uh, en droit d'immigration. I'd like to begin by thanking all of the MOOC participants for having performed at a very impressive level over the course of this second annual uh, immigration MOOC. I'd also like to thank uh, the lead team, uh, as well as the various subcommittees and volunteers, including those that worked on everything from drafting the moot pro uh, program and the rules to organizing uh, the, the technology for this virtual uh, uh, moot. Uh, this includes the lawyers from the DOJ and uh, the LAO, the private bar, Federal Court of Appeal, Federal Court judges, uh, as well as the law clerks that I gather uh, have acquitted themselves uh, quite well over the course of these two days uh, and, and uh, the court's administration uh, services assistance with uh, translation. I should also thank the sponsors. Uh, you all know who you are and I gather there are a large number of, of you. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't also take the opportunity to recognize Justice Diner's role as the visionary and driving force behind this moot. Uh, certainly uh, getting it up and running for the first time last year. So uh, again, kudos and hats off to Justice Diner. As the saying goes, uh, build it and they will come. Well, you know, the great turnout uh, vindicated that confident vision uh, in spades. So congratulations. I think it's safe to say that this uh, second iteration of the annual moot was uh, an unequivocal success. I understand that more law schools attended this second year of the moot uh, than before, and that even more may be lined up for next year. So as the saying goes, uh, we're off to the races. 
Um, people have been sharing effusive feedback with me about how things went yesterday and today. Uh, although we would have obviously preferred to have done the moot in person, uh, that wasn't possible for reasons we all know. But the silver lining is that we have a new generation of future uh, immigration litigators who are becoming familiar with this virtual way of doing things, uh, what we call our digital shift. Uh, and in that regard, I'll, I'll just note that virtual hearings in the immigration law area have become the default now and, and all virtually, or virtually is probably not the best word, but uh, literally uh, all, the exclusive way of doing things with a, a very, very small number of exceptions. Uh, I'll say that between March 16th, 2020 and February 28th of this year, the court held uh, 7,036 hearings, uh, 130 of which were in person. And this is right, right across all areas, less so in this particular area. Uh, 3,121 of which are 44% by teleconference and 3,785 of which, which is 53.8% held by video conference. This is the new normal. Uh, many of us have been saying that there's no going back. Uh, and what we mean by this is that our transformation from being more digitally accessible has been accelerated by the adjustments that we all uh, had to make that were necessary to be made to maintain the court, uh, access to the court over the course of the various waves of the pandemic. Uh, we are anticipating that many people may prefer to go back to in-person hearings, especially for multi-day or multi-week trials where there are witnesses to be cross-examined. Uh, and we also expect that maybe uh, some counsel in the immigration uh, space are going to want to continue to avail themselves of the time and cost savings associated with these virtual hearings. And that's certainly been the feedback that we've been receiving consistently from the bar, including over the last few months. So I guess only time is going to tell, uh, on verra, as our uh, francophone colleagues would say. Uh, in any event, the volume of our work in this area is increasing, so we're looking forward to seeing some of the new faces once they get called to the bar uh, in front of us. Uh, there's going to be more demand for fine young lawyers such as yourselves if you choose to work in this field. So uh, uh, I, I guess before I close, I, I should uh, take this opportunity to encourage all of you to think about applying for a clerkship if you haven't already done so already. Uh, as I mentioned or alluded to earlier, several of our current clerks have uh, assisted with the moot. And so I'd encourage you to uh, reach out to them if you have access to them. So with those few remarks, I'm going to turn the, word, uh, the floor back over to the organizers. Uh, Amusez-vous bien ce soir. Au plaisir de vous revoir dans la salle d'audience, que ce soit virtuel ou en personne. I look forward to seeing you all again in the courtroom, whether it's virtual or in person. Have a nice evening and keep well. Thank you so much, Chief Justice Crampton, for your remarks. We really appreciate the federal court's ongoing support of the moot. Uh, and also, please apply to Department of Justice as well, not just the federal court. <laughs> Next up, we have KCB, who is going to guide us through our very first cocktail and mocktail making session of the evening. Over to you, Casey. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is KCB, and uh, I am going to take us through a couple of cocktails this evening. So uh, I am a lawyer at the Department of Justice. I work for uh, Department of Justice in the Global Affairs LSU, um, which is uh, very exciting and interesting, especially these days. And um, I got involved in the moot because I, uh, well, I clerked last year and uh, volunteered to help out with a few things. And um, I just think the uh, moot's a great way to uh, uh, show your legal knowledge and test your skills. So uh, yeah, a little bit about my background is before I, uh, went to law school, I owned a couple of cocktail bars in Toronto. And so uh, I've kept up the hobby. I kept it up during law school where I worked one night a week uh, in a cocktail bar in Winnipeg. And uh, now it's uh, less work for me and more of just a hobby. 
So uh, in any case, we're going to be making two cocktails throughout the evening. For those of you who drink alcohol, uh, we're going to go through uh, the Gold Rush or the Bee's Knees for the first cocktail. The Gold Rush is a whiskey-based cocktail and the Bee's Knees is a gin-based cocktail. They're the same basic cocktail, but with two different spirits. Uh, both of them are classic cocktails and I did not come up with the recipes myself. Um, if you do not drink alcohol, uh, then what you're going to do is you're going to do everything that we do uh, for the gold rush, but you're going to double the lemon and honey. And after you shake your cocktail, you're going to add a bit of soda water uh, to top it up. Okay. So <clears throat> just a couple of things about cocktails in general. Uh, the secret to a great cocktail is to measure and to um, uh, balance the cocktail out. Uh, gone are the days of Tom Cruise, uh, you know, flipping bottles and, and pouring without any um, consideration as to uh, the actual ingredients and the, le the, the level of, of uh, <clears throat> the balance of ingredients in the cocktail. We now like to measure everything. We like to really know what we're doing because that's how you're going to get a fantastic cocktail. So, um, with that being said, let's start on our first drink. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to add our whiskey. So um, I'm using Lot 40 Rye, which is a Canadian whiskey. It's a Canadian rye whiskey. It's 100% rye. And rye uh, generally gives whiskey a very spicy flavor. And so um, this is really uh, a fantastic product. Uh, I also gave the option for Alberta Premium, which is a slightly lower cost whiskey. It's also fantastic and it's also 100% rye. So you're gonna get a very similar characteristic in uh, whichever whiskey you're using. If you're using gin, uh, you're gonna do the exact same thing, except you're gonna use gin in this cocktail. And that's one interesting thing about cocktails is once you get some of the basics down, um, you can really swap the spirits and swap ingredients and still make a great cocktail because it's all really about balance. It's about balancing the cocktail between the spirit, the sour, the sweet. Uh, and so it's, it's quite easy to come up with your own originals once you've got a few of the classics down. So mindful of the time, we're going to take two ounces or 60 milliliters of whichever spirit you're using and put it into a shaker. Now, I recognize that some, not all of you will have fancy cocktail shakers. I put in the instructions that you can use a Nalgene bottle or you can use a mason jar. Uh, just keep in mind, we are gonna be shaking this very hard. So please don't put it in any glass vessel that could break, okay? So after that, we're going to add some lemon juice. So I, Hope you have something to squeeze lemon with, something like this. If not, you can always just use a fork and uh, uh, squeeze it into the glass, but you're gonna measure out one ounce. So half the amount of spirit that you put in. For uh, ease, I've met, uh, squeezed mine already. Using fresh lemon juice was a really big change for the cocktail world from the 1990s. A lot of places would use uh, uh, fake lemon, powdered lemon, lemonade, things like that. And a big sw uh, switch in the cocktail world when things started getting much, much better was when they started using fresh ingredients. So we always like to use fresh lemon if possible. The next thing we're gonna put in is the honey syrup. So um, I asked you in your instructions to mix uh, one part honey with one part warm water and make a nice solution. And the reason you do that is because you want it to be able to mix easily in the drink. And if you're using honey that hasn't been um, uh, mixed with water, it doesn't really mix as well. It kind of clumps up and it, it, it isn't, uh, uh, it just isn't quite as good. So we've got the three ingredients now in our shaker. For those of you who aren't imbibing, it'll be two ingredients. And now we're going to take some ice. Okay. I asked you for two trays of ice. I put this in a yogurt container because I'm not near my fridge. You want to use a lot of ice. The reason why you use a lot of ice is because you, 
you really are going to shake this hard. You, and the goal to shaking a drink isn't just to mix it. What you're actually doing is you're adding water to the ingredients. You're watering it down a little bit until it's a little bit more palatable. If we drank this as is, even if we chilled it, it would be far too strong, far too sweet, and far too sour all at once because it would be this overloading of flavor. So we're adding the ice and we're going to shake it because we want to water down the cocktail. We've all heard of uh, shaken not stirred from James Bond and really the difference between shaking and stirring a cocktail is when you're shaking a cocktail you're adding a lot of air you're adding a lot of uh, bubbles you're really aerating the drink and that's something that um, you generally want to do to cocktails that are with juices uh, lemon juice lime juice things like that ironically it's not generally done for stirred cocktails which a martini or for sorry for spirit forward cocktails like a martini or a Manhattan. And so when James Bond asked for his, cock, his martini shaken, not stirred, he wasn't being a connoisseur who was telling them the right way to do it. He was being a rebel because he wanted it the wrong way. He knew he was asking for it the wrong way. Because if he had just ordered a martini, the bartender would have 100% of the time stirred the cocktail and not shaken it. We can talk about whether he was right or wrong another time, but uh, just, just so you know, uh, that's sort of the history between behind shaken, not stirred. So we've got our liquid and our ice in whatever we're shaking the, uh, it in. And now we're gonna somehow seal it. So for some of you, that'll be closing the Nalgene. Some of you might have cocktail shakers. And when you're shaking a cocktail, you're gonna shake it as hard as you can for a very long time until your hands get quite cold. By a very long time, I mean longer than you think you need to. And really when I'm training people on how to shake a cocktail, what I'm trying to impress on them is you're trying, you're, you're gonna hold it and you're gonna try to slam the ice and the liquid back and forth and really hammer it down. You're trying to bust it up. You're trying to really shake it hard and, and, and get it really cold and really juicy. So I'm gonna do that for you now. So, and you're gonna shake for about 20 seconds. You've got a nice cold cocktail, it's nicely shaken. You've added water to the drink. And now you're gonna pour it into your cup, just like so. And you're gonna add a lemon wheel to that, just like so. If you're not imbibing tonight, once you put everything into the uh, glass, you probably will have a little room at the top. Add your soda, give it a very little stir because you don't want to, uh, um, get all of the bubbles out of the soda, the soda water. You still want to have a bit of fizz to it. Uh, and then uh, drop in your lemon wheel and enjoy. So got a little bit of time left, so that's fine. Yeah. So let's say I'll say cheers. Okay. So that's either the gold rush or the bee's knees. Um, I can say congratulations to all the mooders. I myself mooded uh, at a different mood a couple of years ago. I had a great time and I found it very rewarding. Uh, one thing I can also add now is if you take a sip and you find it a little bit too tart or a little bit too sweet, you could always add a little bit more honey or a little bit more lemon to it. Give it a quick stir. Um, drinks are all about balance and really you should be drinking the drink however you best find it. So uh, that's it from me from the first round and uh, Cheers, everyone. All right, thank you, Casey. I, I have to say, I've been working with Casey for about two years now, and I had no idea that he was such a talented mix master. That's amazing. All right, now I'd like to move on to our uh, next portion of the evening. Um, I'd like to introduce Justice Diner, the Honorary Chair of the Immigration and Refugee Law Mood, and a judge of the federal court, and he's going to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Justice Diner, over to you. Okay. Um, merci, Judy. Ça marche pour moi? Oui. Um, alors, j'ai le privilège d'introduire uh, Monsieur le juge John Evans. 
le juge Evans a été euh, juge de la Cour d'appel fédérale entre les années 1999 jusqu'à 2013. Mm -hmm. Et il était à la Cour fédérale pour un bref séjour avant qu'il euh, est devenu juge de la Cour d'appel. À la Cour d'appel, c'était avec notre Cour, la Cour fédérale. Il était là juste un an entre 1998 et 1999. Ce n'était um, pas beaucoup de temps à notre cours, mais il a écrit un des, des jugements les plus cités. Uh, Peut-être que c'est le, le jugement le plus cité uh, de tout le temps. Um, de la Cour fédérale qui est très, très célébrée en droit d'immigration qui s'appelle Cepida Gutiérrez. Et um, alors, je suis certaine que beaucoup d'entre parmi vous uh, connaissez cette cause. Um, John est, est une véritable icône dans le droit administratif. Um, et ce n'est pas juste à cause de ses décisions. John était professeur avant que son nomination à la magistrature. Il était prof à London School of Economics. Et puis après ça, à Osgoode Hall Law School. Um, I was fortunate enough to be taught by Justice Evans. Um, he taught more than just administrative law for which he is, um, uh, I was saying an icon in Canada. Uh, he also taught immigration law and other courses, but I was fortunate enough to take administrative law uh, where he has published numerous texts, um, one of the most cited textbooks Um, uh, at the Supreme Court of Canada, um, the Judicial Review of Administrative Action in Canada, and I'm um, not going to go through all John's publications because we'd be here all night. Anyway, John has won multiple awards, and um, I will also spare you that. You may read about him more on the um, website where he's um, currently Uh, helping uh, in the practice of law at Gold, Gold, excuse me, Goldblatt Partners. And without any further ado, my former professor and uh, former colleague, Justice John Evans. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you very much, Alan, for those uh, overly generous remarks, but I'm very glad to accept them. Alan was too modest to tell you that he was one of the star students uh, in immigration law. I think he was in the um, student in the very first um, year that we offered the intensive uh, immigration law program. Professors, former professors know they're getting old when they can count at least a dozen former students who are now distinguished members of the, the bench. Um, there have been two on the federal court, including Alan and uh, Justice Sossin on the court, Ontario Court of Appeal and a number of other luminaries. Well, let me start with the first things first, and that is to give thanks. I know I'm repeating what others have said, but they're important. So on behalf of all who participated in, the, in this moot over the last two days, I want to thank and congratulate all the organizers of the event who've worked so hard to make it such a success. And I'd say it's in the best traditions of the bar that busy practicing lawyers volunteer their time and their professional skills to provide to tomorrow's lawyers a rich education experience that supplements their classroom studies. I also want to congratulate our mooters. I judged the final round, one of the judges of the final round, and I can tell you this, that if the quality of the finalists is any indication, as I'm sure it is, you are all well on your way to becoming effective advocates. It takes a real commitment to your professional development to be prepared to devote to mooting the necessary hard work, time and energy, to say nothing of the stress involved in making oral arguments and responding to judges' often ill-informed questions. In these remarks, I, I want to say something about 
what you can learn from Mushi about advocacy and about the subject of this moot, immigration and refugee law. So what can Mushi teach you about lawyering and about advocacy in particular? Well, here are some examples. You will all have spent a lot more time working on your case than the judges will have spent in reading the submissions. And you'll know a lot more about it than the judges ever will. So it's important to make your argument easy for the judges to follow. You have to work hard to make your argument simple when you've been immersed in all the details of the case for so long. So simplicity is important. And be concise, no verbiage, please. And keep your arguments focused. Stick to your main points and don't chase rabbits down rabbit holes that don't need to be chased. The second point I make is that while you have to be on top of the details of the facts and the law and to know your record and the authorities, backwards, forwards, inside and out, it's important not to lose sight of the big picture. What in a nutshell is your case about and why is it important? Thirdly, as you will have heard over the last two days, there's always something to be said on each side of a legal dispute. And if you're going to be able to refute effectively your opponent's argument and to answer the judge's questions, you have to understand your opponent's case just as well as you understand your own. Fourthly, every position has its weaknesses. Don't believe your own propaganda. Identify the weaknesses in your argument so you can answer questions from the bench. And if you're well prepared, judges' questions can be your best friends because they give you an opportunity to clarify parts of your argument that may not have been clear to the listeners and to show up its weak points. So much for advocacy and mooting. Let me now turn to the subject matter of the moot, immigration law. As we are all too painfully aware, this moot is being held in the shadow of the humanitarian catastrophe in Ukraine. As people's homes, hospitals, schools, civic buildings are bombed, and as millions flee the devastation of war and seek refuge in other countries. This is a refugees crisis of a scale unknown in Europe since the Second World War. At this point, the international community has, for the most part, stood up to be counted, as countries offer safety and support to the displaced. Now, this has really been a matter much more of political will and international cooperation than it has law. It's a result of government's willingness to suspend the normal rules and to respond to popular expressions of solidarity with the courageous Ukrainian people. Well, even before these tragic events, immigration has had a very important place in our country. Unlike most Western countries, Canada remains a country of immigration. And as a key component of the government's economic policy, the government aims to admit more than 400,000 people in each of the next three years. That is about a 3% addition to our aging population, far more than other comparable countries are admitting. On the refugee side, Canada has a decent record in international efforts to resettle those fleeing war, natural disasters and persecution, and fairly processing claims for asylum made by those who make it to our borders. Now, these public policies are given legal effect through immigration and refugee law. And this means that lawyers have a particular responsibility for ensuring that the law is accurately, fairly, and humanely applied to individuals. The importance of immigration law in our legal system is evidenced by its growing impact on other areas of the law. In administrative law, Baker is a leading case on procedural fairness, and Kanthasami is an important case on the substantive review of ministerial discretion. 
Both cases, as you probably know, arose from immigration officials' refusal to grant applications to remain in Canada for people who applied to leave to remain on humanitarian and compassionate grounds. Important charter cases have also arisen in the immigration context. The Singh case, for example, was a very early case on section seven of the charter. And it was a case in which the court guaranteed, held that section seven guaranteed to claimants for refugee status, a right to an oral hearing before being removed from Canada to a country where they feared persecution. This momentous decision by the Supreme Court led to the creation of the Immigration and Refugee Board and the um, model of procedure that it follows. In addition to administrative law and the Charter, immigration lawyers also have to be familiar with international human rights conventions, which often bear upon immigration decision making of a discretionary nature and upon refugee law. And they must also come to grips with the dreaded IRPA, the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act, an act rivaled in complexity and length only by the Income Tax Act, in my experience anyway. And coming to grips with IRPA, IRPA gives lawyers' statutory interpretation muscles a thorough workout. But above all, immigration law deals with decisions that have a pro profound effect on people's lives. Some are literally matters of life and death. And whether a law lawyers are representing an individual or the government, immigration lawyers have a crucial part to play in these very high state contexts. And they play it by applying their legal skills and compassion to ensure that justice is done within the parameters of the law. This is an area of legal practice where lawyers can make a profound difference to individuals' lives, to keeping Canadians safe, and to maintain the public's confidence in the integrity of the system. Finally, and that's a judge, that's a word that judges often love to hear from counsel. Finally, I hope you've enjoyed participating in this move and that you found all the effort you put into it worthwhile. I hope also that you find a fulfilling career in the law whatever direction it may take. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Justice Evans. That was a really thought-provoking um, message. And it's also good to know that you want, like to hear us say finally and know that we're wrapping up. But we're not there yet this evening. Um, thank you also to Justice Diner, who I did not know was a star student uh, in law school. So there we go. Uh, so thank you to both justices. And now we're going to turn the event back over to Casey for our second beverage of the night. Casey, over to you. Hi, everyone. Uh, okay, I'm back. So that's great. Uh, thanks to, uh, to Justice Evans. Uh, and um, it's great to, uh, to hear from you. Um, my, uh, my wife's bringing me a glass because I forgot to slid it across the floor thanks um, so uh we're a little ahead of schedule so um all right so we're going to be making two cocktails for the second um go of it we're going to make the alcohol free cocktail first and so um alcohol free cocktails are of course really important because uh a lot of people choose to drink for a lot of different reasons or sorry a lot of people choose not to drink for a lot of different reasons and um it's important to be able to craft a cocktail uh, for people who don't drink spirits that that actually uh, is more than just a juice or a soda or something like that. And so I would say the secret to a great alcohol free cocktail is something that tastes really good, but challenges you enough that you don't just want to throw it back and drink it really, really quickly. And so we're going to use some, uh, some uh, uh, basically there has to be at least one ingredient in there that challenges you a little bit. Um, and so uh, basically that ingredient today is ginger beer, but often uh, we can use a lot of different things in, in uh, spirit-free cocktails that challenge you to drink a little bit slower. So <clears throat> first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take our cucumber and we're gonna put it into the shaker. So I've pre-diced my cucumber up. 
We're gonna put that into the shaker. And cucumber is great in cocktails because the flavor uh, goes throughout whatever it's being mixed with really, really quickly. You don't need a long infusion and often just shaking it for a little while will be completely good enough um, uh, to get the flavor in. So we're gonna put the cucumber in. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna put lemon juice. And so uh, we've got 1.5 ounces of lemon juice that's gonna go into the shaker. And we're gonna put the same amount, 1.5 ounces of honey syrup into the shaker. And then we're gonna add our ice. And as before, we're gonna shake it nice and hard. So take a nice smell of that and really get the cucumber off there right off the bat. It's just fantastic. And you're gonna pour it into your glass. There's gonna be some cucumber chunks in there. Um, in a perfect world, we could strain it, but I really wanted to avoid uh, having you know, participants buy a million pieces of cocktail equipment, so that's fine. And then we're gonna take our ginger beer. I'm using a Grace ginger beer, a nice Jamaican brand. And we're just gonna to top it up. And you can give it a quick stir. And then cut yourself if you have your cucumber nearby, a nice cucumber wheel. And you can garnish your drink like that. You can have a nice refreshing, yet challenging alcohol-free cocktail. That's delicious, if I do say so myself. If you uh, are interested in that drink but want to add spirit to it, I think gin would go very well, as well as rum would go very well in there as, as well. Um, in which case I would use slightly less of the honey and the lemon, maybe one ounce each. All right, and then uh, on to the final cocktail of the night, the old fashioned. So. This is, a, I've called it the Canadian old fashioned because we're using Canadian whiskey and we're using maple syrup. And uh, I think, uh, you know, old fashions, like the traditional way to make an old fashioned is bourbon, it's with sugar, not, not maple syrup. Um, but the nice thing about cocktails, as I said before, is you can really kind of um, customize it. We can switch things out. We, we're switching the sugar for the maple syrup. We're switching bourbon for a Canadian whiskey or rye. And uh, it's going to be it's going to be really delicious. So we're going to make this just in our in our glass. And uh, it might normally be made in a mixing glass if you go to a fancy cocktail bar. But uh, again, I didn't want to make people buy more than they needed to. So if you're going with the bitters, this is great. So here's a little story. You can see that the label on these bitters doesn't actually fit the bottle. And the story behind that is these uh, these British gents back in 18 something uh, had this idea to make these bitters, which was sort of a tonic back then. It was it was used to uh, cure whatever ails you. And uh, they were gonna make it in Trinidad because that's where a lot of the ingredients come from like chincona bark and baking spices and things like that often come from that part of the world. So they got everything ready to go when they were in the United Kingdom, but when they got to Trinidad and they started assembling everything, they realized someone had made a mistake and their labels were too big. So uh, they didn't have the money to get it fixed. So instead they just decided to put the labels on their bottles in this misshapen way. And it became kind of their trademark. And so, you know, over a hundred years later, they're still doing the same thing with the bottle. Uh, there you go. Anyways, so I'm going to do two dashes of bitters. And, and when you do a bitter dash, what you really want to do is you want to just, you don't want to like, eh, you want to turn it right upside down and go one, two. And so when you're looking at what you need in the glass, you've actually got some liquid in there. 
Okay. If you didn't uh, buy the bitters, that's fine. It's not, I mean, it is a traditional ingredient and old fashioned, but um, I was trying to keep things, you know, reasonable for the cost for everyone. So uh, it'll taste pretty good without it as well. So we're then gonna go back to our lot 40 rye. Now old fashions taste great made with rye, but they also taste great made with rum and they taste great made with brandy and they taste great made with scotch. So you can really use any brown spirit. You can, you can make a gin or a vodka old fashioned as well, but it's going to be um, a little more challenging to make it taste great. You have to use a few aromatics. Email me if you want some tips. So we're gonna do two ounces of whatever spirit you're using. And that goes into the glass. In a perfect world, you'd be able to see every, my, my counter and everything I'm doing. I'm trying to hold everything up uh, so you can see it. All right, so we're gonna do maple syrup now. Um, I've got a nice Quebec maple syrup, super delicious, organic. I guess all maple syrup's gonna probably be organic because who fertilizes? Well, I guess some people fertilize trees. And we're gonna put about a teaspoon into that. Again, you can adjust this if you want it a little sweeter or a little uh, more tart, uh, less sweet and a little stronger. You can put a little, a little less in, but a teaspoon is about the right amount. After that, you're gonna add your ice right to the glass. This time we're gonna stir the cocktail. And as I said, sometimes you shake a cocktail, sometimes you stir a cocktail. The reason you don't shake an old fashioned is because you don't want the bubbles. What you want is you want a nice smooth stir. What you're really doing is you're moving the ice around. You're not moving, you're not moving the liquid, you're moving the ice. So stir, stir, and you can see the level of the ice is getting lower and lower in the glass as it melts. You might be surprised to know we're actually adding about an ounce of water. And an ounce of water is about right for a drink like an old fashioned. So I'm sure you've all been counting how many times you've been stirred. Um, but basically you're stirring about one time for every percentage of alcohol in the main spirit. So uh, lot 40 is 43% alcohol. So I stirred exactly 43 times. That's not true. I wasn't actually counting, but uh, that's just sort of your, your general rule. Now, if we had a sip of this right now, it would taste good. You'd enjoy it and you'd say, boy, that was a, a fine cocktail. But if you really want to bring it up to the next level, you're going to get the orange I asked you to buy. You're gonna get your vegetable peeler or knife. Please be careful and we do not take any responsibility for any injuries. Uh, and you're going to take a, a section of peel. What you really want is you want peel that doesn't have much pith on it, okay? It's very thin and they call it expressing. So what we're actually gonna do is we take the outside of the peel, we point it towards the glass and then we're gonna fold this in half towards the glass and it's gonna shoot oil over the drink. And then we're gonna put it into the drink, give it a quick stir and drop it in. And if you now bring it up to your nose and smell, you're gonna smell a beautiful orange uh, uh, nose on this. Without that, really it's not an old fashioned, it's just whiskey, sugar and bitters. Uh, this is what really elevates the drink from meh to amazing. So uh, with that, let's all say cheers. And uh, I want to thank everyone for, for uh, listening to me ramble about cocktails. And uh, once again, congratulations. I hope to see you all next year in some capacity. And uh, cheers. All right, Casey. Nice. That was very good. I'm very impressed by Casey's bartending skills. I had no idea. I haven't done Thank a you. bartending session yet at Global Affairs, but I'm sure it's uh, going to happen at some point. <laughs> so apparently Casey was the bartender for the federal court clerks last year. So he's uh, he's making the rounds. Um, all right. Thank you so much, Casey. That was great. Um, we are now at the point where we're going to take a break, um, but somehow, uh, I'm not sure how that happened with so many lawyers involved, we are actually ahead of schedule. Um, so we are gonna take a slightly longer break than um, we had intended to. We're still going to break until 7.30. Um, so instead of a quick five minutes, um, people will get 15 minutes uh, to have a quick little bathroom break or stretch or whatever you need to do. Um, before we leave though, I just, uh, I was asked to pass on a message to each of the mooters. Um, the message was that, um, 
shoot. <laughs> Sorry, somebody did send me a message and now I'm trying to find where they, there we go. Um, we've, I've been asked to tell the Mooters that um, when we start presenting the awards, if your name is called, we're gonna ask you to raise your hand in the Zoom chat, uh, not in real life, uh, but the Zoom hand. Um, and that's gonna help our uh, Zoom producer, Chris, uh, make sure that you are spotlighted. Um, so thank you everyone. Um, and we will see you back here in 15 minutes.
Hello and welcome back everyone. I uh, hope you had a nice little break. Uh, we're now going to begin the awards portion of the evening. Each award is going to be presented by one of our generous sponsors. First up, we have one special lady, Chantal Delage of the Delage Law Group Professional Corporation to present the Top Factum Award. Over to you, Chantal. Bonsoir tout le monde. Uh, je m'appelle Chantal Deloge. Je suis l'associé principal de Deloge Law Group. Nous sommes un cabinet d'avocats spécialisé en droit de l'immigration et des réfugiés au centre-ville de Toronto. Ce soir, je remets le prix pour la meilleure mémoire. Il est, euh, il est, oh, désolé, j'ai perdu, euh, il est décerné à la faculté de droit euh, qui a obtenu les, no les notes combinées les plus élevées des juges pour leur mémoire de l'appelant et de l'intimé. Les gagnants du prix recevront un exemplaire de Canadian Immigration Law and Practice par l'auteur Lauren Waldman. Je vais d'abord annoncer le finaliste, puis j'annoncerai le lauréat. Je demanderai ensuite à l'équipe gagnante d'activer leur caméra. L'équipe finaliste pour le prix de meilleure mémoire est l'Université de Sherbrooke. Bravo! Et puis, je suis très heureuse d'annoncer que le gagnant est l'équipe de l'Université de Toronto avec Ying Sui Li, Iris Liu, Amy Chan et Alexa Chung. Bravo, bravo, applaudissements. Félicitations aux gagnants et aussi à, à tous les plaideurs et les entraîneurs aussi. We could please have the winners from the University of Toronto uh, raise their hands and uh, come on screen with us. Thank you so much, ladies, and congratulations to you on the award. Thank you so much. Excellent work. Thank you. All right. Now on to the next award. Uh, thank you, Chantal. Uh, the next person we have up is my colleague and friend, Dupe Oluyomi Obasi from the Department of Justice. And she's going to be announcing the award for the top oralist team. Over to you, Dupe. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I am Dupe Oliomi Abasi from the Department of Justice. I am Senior Counsel and a Deputy Regional Director in Immigration Law Division of the DOJ. And I'm thrilled to be a part of the MOOC this year. Our office, the Immigration Law Division, is essentially the largest immigration law firm in the country, with almost 100 lawyers practicing immigration refugee and citizenship law, combined with other offices and the DOJ around the country, we have dozens of counsel who have volunteered for this MOOC this year. And I want to commend all the MOOCers and the organizing team and the judges and the volunteer uh, panels for a great job and for a very successful event. This is an interesting and important area of law that is relevant and as Justice Seven said, it, in times that we're living right now, vital. So it's great to see the work in this area of law being showcased in this meet. Without any further ado, I'd like to present the award for the top oralist team. It's awarded to the law school whose appellant and respondent meters receive the highest average combined scores from judges in the day one preliminary rounds. And the winners of this prize will receive an annotated copy of the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act of Canada, the 2021 edition that was donated by the Canadian Immigration Lawyers Association. I'll first announce the runner up to this round and then the award winner. And I would ask the winning team to please turn on your camera. So drum roll, please. 
The runner-up for the Top Oralist Team Award is the University of Ottawa Common Law Section. And I'm very happy to announce that the winner of the Top Oralist Team Award is the University of Alberta team of Kyla Ronberg, Thomas Faith, Elias Jimenez Gonzalez, and Brianna Frank. Please give them a round of applause. Congratulations to all the winners, as well as to all the mooters and their coaches. University of Alberta team, if we could just get you all on screen so we can all give you a big virtual round of applause. Great job, everybody. Great job. Uh, and have... thank Sorry? Oh, I was, I was yeah, just going to say thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Please, go, go, go ahead. We're, we're happy to hear you. Um, thank you so much, Dupay. Uh, and congratulations to the team from the University of Alberta. Uh, next up, we have our very own uh, Tony Navanilan. Oh, I'm so sorry. My, I'm still getting used to all the Zoom stuff, apparently. Um, <laughs> next up, we have our very own Tony Navanilan. Um, and he's going to be representing the Canadian Association of Refugee Lawyers. And he's going to present the award for Top Oralist Mooter. Tony? Thanks so much, Judy. So as Judy mentioned, in addition to being co-chair of the MOOT, uh, I also moonlight as the vice president of the Canadian Association of Refugee Lawyers here in Canada. Uh, the acronym goes by CARL, and CARL was formed in 2011, so we're just over a decade old. And currently we represent uh, around 300 immigration and refugee lawyers, as well as academics and article students across the country. Uh, CARL was formed principally to engage in advocacy for refugee issues in Canada. We do a lot of strategic litigation, including about 20 interventions in the Supreme Court of Canada over the past decade. Uh, as well as our own public address litigation that's resulted in at least three uh, declarations of constitutional validity in respect of various provisions under the Immigration Act. Uh, it's an all volunteer organization. Uh, it does take up a lot of our time outside of work, but it is certainly a, a labor of love for us. Uh, so we're very proud to be sponsoring the MOOT and we're very proud to see uh, amazing law students who we hope one day will join the profession. Uh, and if you are representing private clients, uh, joining our organization in the future. Uh, to, we sponsored the MOOT last year as the principal sponsor and we're really proud to come back again this year as one of the major sponsors. Uh, tonight I am presenting the award for Top Oralist Mooter. And that award is awarded to the Mooter with the highest average combined score from the judges in day one of the preliminary rounds. Uh, the winner of the prize will be receiving a copy of Crossing Laws Borders, Canada's Refugee Resettlement Program, which is donated by the author, uh, Professor Shauna Lobman, a good friend of mine. Uh, as with the other awards tonight, I will first announce the runner up and then I will announce the award winner and then I'll ask the winning mooter to turn on his or her camera at that point so we can congratulate you. So the runner up for the top oralist mooter award is Rachel Conway or Corwin of the University of Ottawa's common law section. So congratulations to her. And I'm very happy to announce that the winner of the top oralist mooter award this year is Camille Bontem also of the University of Ottawa's Common Law section. Camille, are you here today with us? Oh, there you are. Congratulations, Camille. It's a wonderful outcome for you today and I'm very sure you've earned it. Uh, so congratulations to you. Great moot. Uh, and I will also pass on my congratulations to all the mooters today. Uh, as well as their coaches, who are, who are also very much unsung heroes uh, of the moot for all your hard work over the past year. I'll pass it back to you, Judy. And thanks again, or congrats again, Camille. Congratulations, Camille. Thank you so much, Tony. Uh, now we are going to move on to uh, our next award. And we have Sarah Adler from Baker McKenzie to present the award for the top law school. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sarah Adler, and I am the Canadian Immigration Lawyer with the Employment and Compensation Department of Baker McKenzie. Baker McKenzie is a multinational law firm with a focus on helping business clients overcome the challenges of, of competing in the global economy. 
we recognize that refugee issues affect us all and have significant impact on the development and progression of our global economy. Far from being a remote or marginalized issue, mass movement of people due to untenable situations in their home countries are now more common than ever. Our global economy and digital connectivity mean that the people affected are now our business partners, our colleagues, our friends, and we at Baker are committed to helping those, helping both our clients and our colleagues to find solutions to these issues. Issues that I have dealt with multiple times over the past few weeks. Participating in events like this is part of finding those solutions as it teaches us all participants and observers alike to think about displacement challenges in an innovative and creative capacity to help fuel future solutions. Tonight, I am presenting the award for top law school. It is awarded to the law school with the highest combined scores from judges based on their appellant and respondent facta and their day one preliminary rounds. The winners of the prize will be receiving a copy of Refugee Law's Fact Finding Crisis, Truth, Risk, and the Wrong Mistake, donated by the author, Professor Hillary Evans Cameron. I will first announce the runners up and then I will announce the award winner. I will then ask the winning team to turn off their cameras. The runner up for the top law school award is the University of Alberta. I'm very happy to announce that the winner is the University of Toronto team, Ying Zhu Li, Iris Liu, Amy Chen, and Alexa Chung. Please give them a round of applause. Congratulations to the winners, as well as to all the mooters and their coaches. Have a great evening. Thank you. Congratulations, U of T. If everyone who's on with us could put on their cameras so we can give you a round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great job. Great job, everybody. All right. Thank you so much. And thank you, Sarah. We are now going to move on to the final award of the night. Um, and we have Stéphane Duval from McCarthy Tetro MTI Plus to present the award for the champion group. Over to you, Stéphane. Thank you very much. Uh, what a two days it's been. So I, my name is Stéphane Duval. I'm a partner at the law firm McCarthy Tetro, heading the immigration group uh, called MTI Plus a group of more than 30 professionals solely dedicated to immigration. Uh, ce soir, um, je vais présenter ou remettre le prix à l'équipe championne. Il est décerné à l'équipe de la ronde finale, de la plaidoirie finale, qui a reçu le meilleur pointage des juges. So tonight I'm presenting the award for champion group. It's awarded to the team from the final round who received the highest Scores from judges. Les gagnants vont recevoir un exemplaire du volume La Cour d'appel fédérale et la Cour fédérale 50 ans d'histoire, qui est gracieusement offert par la Cour fédérale. Merci infiniment pour ce, ce magnifique cadeau. Alors, sans plus tarder, without further ado, je suis très heureux d'annoncer que les gagnants, so the winners of the final round are Kyla Ronneberg and Thomas Faith from University of Alberta. Please turn on your cameras so that we can congratulate you. Congratulations, Kyla and Thomas. Amazing job. You should be really proud of yourselves. Yes, indeed. It was a two, oh, two days of great performance. Congratulations. And also, I would like to congratulate uh, the other teams. So, Elias Jimenez Gonzalez and Brianna uh, Freype. Who, were, who made it to the final round as well. So congratulations. Thank you, everyone. I know it's, uh, it's a little odd being on, uh, on a virtual situation and we, we can't uh, do the, the proper applause and hand out the awards, but just know everyone out here in, in virtual land is applauding for you guys and for all the various winners this evening. Great job to everyone. Um, it just, it was just such a, a marvelous, marvelous performance from everyone. So thank you so much. Um, before we move on to um, the final speech of the evening, 
Um, we have Justice Diner, who just has uh, one other brief comment to, uh, to provide for us about one of our sponsors. Justice Diner. Okay, thank you, uh, Judy. I was just asked to pass along a message from the Canadian Association of Immigration Lawyers, which is one of the sponsors this evening. And that was that that's a new um, immigration association in Canada. And so for uh, tous les étudiants qui sont ici ce soir, for all, all students who are here, it is free uh, if you would like to join that association. Normally there's um, a fee associated like most legal associations and that one is offering students free membership. So um, I would encourage you to look into that. The uh, CELA is the website, Canadian Immigration Lawyers Association. Thank you very much, Judy. Thank you, Justice Diner. All right. Well, thank you uh, to all of the sponsors for being here with us tonight and presenting the awards. And thank you so much to all of the Mooters for your participation. Um, it's really been a wonderful couple days and, and we couldn't be happier with the way everything's turned out. Um, now, uh, before we conclude this event, um, we have some closing remarks from Rima Jamu Imsis. Rima is the current representative in Canada for the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. She was named to that position in 2020. Rima earned her law degree from Dalhousie University. She worked for the Information and Privacy Commissioner of Ontario and then a local NGO in Gaza City before beginning her work with the United Nations. She's held many positions with the UN, including the Office of the United Nations Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process, the United Nations Regional Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs and other roles within the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees before becoming the representative for Canada. We're very honored that she was able to be with us here today, especially in light of how busy her organization is at the current moment in time. And so we really appreciate it of Rima being here today with us. Thank you, Rima. We look forward to hearing from you now. Thank you very much, Judy, and uh, congratulations to all of the participants and the winners. Um, I know that you're keen to embark on your celebrations in earnest, so I'm not going to keep you for very long. Um, it's a real privilege and an honor to be with you guys this evening. Um, maybe just a few words on how what you've just done um, connects to the real world out there and what we're seeing at the moment uh, as we look towards the international community and the international stage. If ever you needed to see um, a practical concrete application of, of the principles and the law that you've been working with in this moot, I think the, the current situation in Ukraine provides that um, very well. 71 years ago, uh, the UN Refugee Convention was drafted and UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency that I work for, was established in order to deal with the displacement uh, in the wake of, of World War II and the horrors uh, that were occasioned on the world at that time. Our mandate was only meant to last for three years, and unfortunately the world had other plans as, as history has shown us, and here we are 71 years later. Last year we marked the 70th anniversary of, of the convention, and we very much told the world that we didn't regard this as a celebration, but instead, uh, un unfortunately, a, a real moment to recognize uh, the failure of the international community to safeguard peace and security around the world. Um, it, would, it would make me feel tremendously gratified if I was worked out of a job and we didn't have the situations that we have right now. Um, as you heard from, from Justice Evans, and if we can just turn to Ukraine for, for a quick moment, um, what we're seeing now in, in Europe is a scale of, of, of human flows and, and mass displacement that we haven't witnessed uh, along these lines since World War II. You have two and a half million women, children, and elderly mostly who have fled Ukraine, um, fleeing for their lives literally into neighboring countries, which have commendably kept their borders open throughout this period. Um, and we know that 
amongst those who are fleeing, uh, most of them have left behind husbands and fathers and brothers. And so they're staying close to home with the intention to hopefully return home uh, once once the, the, the hostilities have ceased, hopefully sooner rather than later. We've seen the European Union come forward and confer um, a form of protected status uh, temporarily on those who are fleeing from Ukraine. And within the country itself, unfortunately, we have seen civilians bear the brunt of this conflict as we do in, in many other locations around the world. And we expect, although right now we're estimating that something in the order of 2 million people have been directly impacted by the hostilities and the military offensive, we expect that by, the, by its conclusion, if we continue along the same trajectory, that we'll have at least 12 million people who are internally displaced and in need of assistance and support from humanitarian actors. Maybe just as I round this up to say that if any of you are thinking about a career in this area, I just wanna give you a flavor of how law very much sits at the center of, of our work as the United Nations and my work uh, every single day and, and hope that that may intrigue you and turn your mind towards this as a potential career um, opportunity for you. But law really is at the center of our work and using Ukraine and the situation there right now as a, as a concrete example, law it has informed and guided the actions of the international community uh, since the beginning of this conflict, indeed before we actually had the outbreak of hostilities in the conversations and the efforts taking place in the General Assembly, the Security Council, the Human Rights Council, all of these these various organs, uh, law was very much guiding uh, and informing the efforts and the response of the international community. Um, it's, been a, it's been a framework for the diplomatic efforts uh, to try and find a durable solution and, and hopefully swiftly to the ongoing crisis. And it's been really at the center of the advocacy that we as the United Nations have been doing with all of the neighboring countries, reminding them uh, of the importance of allowing access to territory for asylum seekers and those who are fleeing conflict and persecution um, and ensuring that they have protection and access to uh, asylum on arrival if, if they choose to pursue that. It's also um, in a very concrete and practical way at the center of our negotiations with all the parties to the conflict right now as we negotiate humanitarian corridors. Those are important moments or pauses in the fighting um, that allow civilians safe passage out of the areas that are affected by, by conflict, but also create the space um, and, and provide the unimpeded and sustained access that we as, as humanitarian actors need in order to reach the people affected by the situation so that we can immediately assess needs on the ground and, and provide the, the emergency and life-saving relief that they require. And, and maybe just to say as well that in the pursuit of longer term solutions, I, I, I don't want to be pessimistic, but should we find ourselves in a situation where the, where the current situation carries on for a protracted, length of time and people are not able to return home, um, law very much is at the core of the solutions that we pursue for asylum seekers and refugees, including resettlement, um, which was mentioned also by, by Justice Evans. And, and here I differ with him when he said that Canada has a decent record in this area. I would say it's exemplary. Um, Canada has been a champion and a global leader on resettlement. And, and in fact, for a number of years running has been the number one country uh, in terms of receiving resettled refugees uh, who are fleeing uh, very similar circumstances to what we're seeing in the Ukraine. So these are just some of the practical and concrete ways in which law um, and your education intersect with politics and with, with real situations that are playing out in, in the world. And I encourage you all again to consider these options um, when you're looking at career paths um, and to think about something on the international uh, plane and hope to maybe encounter you as, as colleagues uh, sometime down the road. So perhaps I leave it there and let you get on with the celebrations. And, and again, congratulations uh, on all of your achievements. And, and I hope you have uh, a moment to celebrate and recognize all of that work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rima, for your remarks this evening and for being here tonight with us. Um, I know you have a lot on your plate right now um, with all of the issues going on in Ukraine. 
Um, this could not have been uh, a more appropriate time for us to be considering and discussing refugee law. Um, so thank you so much for being here with us tonight. Um, on a related note, uh, but um, slightly more upbeat, um, I, would, I would echo uh, Rima's statements about uh, considering careers in this area. And I can tell you um, that many of the judges who are uh, lawyers in, in both private practice, Department of Justice, the Immigration Board, um, who have heard all of the mooters over the last two days, um, they, people were, were just extolling um, the, the amazing job that the mooters have done. And if you are considering a field in this area, um, you are strongly encouraged to go forward, uh, apply and, uh, and join this area of law. Um, so I, I'd like to uh, start the uh, conclusion by congratulating all of the mooters again. Um, we know how much work you've put into this, the mooters and their coaches um, over the last year. Uh, it's been almost a year probably that you've been working on this, so thank you. Um, thank you again to all of our sponsors, Baker McKenzie, the Canadian Association of Refugee Lawyers, the Canadian Immigration Lawyers Association, the Department of Justice, Deloge Law Group, McCarthy Tetro and MTI Plus, and the Refugee Lawyers Association of Ontario. And thank you to all of uh, the people who have joined us here this evening, um, who've uh, joined us for the awards, the cocktails and the speeches. Um, we appreciate your taking the time out to join us here this evening as well. So this concludes the 2002 Immigration and Refugee Law Moot. Um, we hope that you've enjoyed yourself, and we hope that you will all be back again next year to join us for the 2023 moot. Good night, everyone. <laughs>